Good morning, everybody. If you can tell, Fonzie's not here today. He's off on vacation. So if I mess up announcements, it's his fault. He shouldn't have taken off. Um, I'm sorry? That's okay. He's probably listening. <laughs> um, everybody got this little white sheet? In your in, it was one of your inserts. It's got a prayer on it. We're going to have this in place of our pastoral prayer today, and it's a responsive prayer. So if you don't have one, we'll make sure and get you one before we start, because we couldn't get the words up on the screen because Fonzie's not here. That's his fault, too. <laughs> Everybody good with that? All right, so, um, yes, I'm picking on him because he's not here. It's his fault for taking off. <laughs> Announcements, uh, trunk or treat, you got the insert in there, Saturday 3 to 6, Saturday the 29th from 3 to 6, so if you all can help out, um, we're going to start collecting candy, and then the day of the trunk or treat, if you can come and, and decorate your trunk, wear a costume if you want, you don't have to make it too complicated, uh, just come and hang out, there are a ton of kids. For three hours, there's a constant stream of kids that come by, and we hand out candy, so we'll need plenty. So um, bring yourself a chair, sit down every now and then. We usually get up there about, an, um, about a half hour, 45 minutes ahead of time. Um, huh? An hour ahead of time. I'm sorry, an hour ahead of time, because they walk off the area so nobody can drive through the area where the kids are going to be. So we need to be there about an hour ahead of time, so we need to be there by 2 o'clock. Um, so we appreciate anybody that can come out and help with that. I think last time we did it, we had about 11 cars. So if you can help us, we appreciate it. Um, also don't forget, um, today is the last day to have in your list of favorite songs that you want to hear sung by the choir. We're going to have a special music day. And if you want to be a part of that, if you thought about singing with the choir, you're welcome to talk to Christy and, um, Try it out. See if you like it. It's a good opportunity. If you've thought about singing with them, it's a good opportunity to try it and see, uh, see how it goes. Uh, Second Sunday Cafe, your menu uh, is in there listed in the bulletin, but this is going to go to our needy fund. Uh, it's taken a hit this, this year um, with the summer food program and then our backpack food program is up to 41 children 
And if you've been to the grocery, you know how expensive groceries are. So it's taken a little bit more to do the things we want to do with Medora School and supporting those families and the, the ones that are in need. So the Second Sunday Cafe, if you can come and support that, all the money that we, that we clear on that is going to go for our needy fund. Um, it needs a little help. Also, Trivia Nights, October the 22nd, coming up. Uh, $50 for a table of up to eight people. You can have up to eight people, but no more than eight people at your table, just in order to keep it free, uh, keep it fair, I'm sorry. Uh, there's always a lot of good food. Um, you won't go away hungry. You might go away feeling sad because you didn't know a lot of the questions, but you won't go away hungry. Yeah, but yeah, there's always plenty of leftovers. So I think that's about all I have to say. Marilyn's going to come up and speak about the uh, United Methodist Women and the Amish recipe. Why don't you grab this microphone right here so they can hear you. Margaret won't mind if you borrow it. <laughs> All right, good morning. And some of you this morning have gotten an envelope that looks like this. And if you did this morning, it has your... Uh, all your Amish recipe information inside it. Some of you had already gotten it previously at uh, various meetings that we've held throughout the week. But anyway, on behalf of the Valley Station United Methodist Women, we'd like to invite you to participate in our third Amish fundraiser. We did this the first year of COVID when everything was shut down and we could not have the salad luncheon or the potato bar at all that year. So we did the Amish uh, recipe fundraiser. It worked out really well, and so we have continued to do it now for two, uh, two more years. So this is our third year. Um, the Valley Station United Methodist Women is made up of women from Bethany and Prairie Village. So that's how come we don't have a church name in front of it because we're the two... Uh, Methodist churches on in this part of town, so we just call it the Valley Station United Methodist Women. Uh, Valley, uh, the United Methodist Women uh, is dedicated to missions, and so the proceeds from the fundraisers that we do have go to missions, uh, such as, well, we were able to support the blessing boxes at Bethany and Prairie Village last year. We give to Southwest Community Ministries. We give to Grace Kids Church, which is over by Churchill Downs, and it's a strictly kids church. Uh, we do support the Methodist Home for Children and Youth and also UMCOR, as well as various other things. We will be, uh, we had a meeting yesterday, and we will be supporting the uh, the youth activity that they're doing for their kits that you're making. So we are going to be supporting that as well as support the, the backpack program as well. We decided on that yesterday. So those are some of the things that we do. Uh, we supported, uh, I mentioned UMCOR. We did send money to Eastern Kentucky for flood disaster relief. We also contributed to the tornado fund and uh, other things. So all of our proceeds go to missions. And so with the sale of the Amish products, they did increase slightly in expense, not a lot, not as much as I expected it to, but anyway, just a little bit, but still have they still have the quality products that you expect them to be. There are a lot of sugar-free items if you're not able to uh, have sugar. So, and, and I know that there are a lot of testimonies in this room because some of, you, <laughs> some of you were already asking, when are we going to do that? Are we doing it this year? So yes, we are. So inside your folder with the order sheet, there is a cover letter and it has all the information. It has dates. It has uh, times, it has phone numbers. So if you read through this, you should find everything that you need. The sale starts today. It goes through October 23rd, three weeks. We have three weeks. So thank you for your support. Any other announcements?
Anything I forgot, Linda? Look, she's not even paying attention. She's not even looking up here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> let's stand as you're able, please, and let's say our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Be seated, please. Thank you. Uh, I have one uh, prayer concern that I want to talk about this morning. Christ, Christy's dad, his name is Robert Owen, is at the Jewish Heart and Lung Center is going to have double bypass, double open heart surgery bypass tomorrow. So we want to be in prayer for Christy's dad. Uh, of course, we have all of our prayer concerns on the back, our ongoing prayer concerns. Anything else this week that's popped up that maybe I'm unaware of? Any extra prayer concerns? That's the one that had the prostate issue, is that right? Awesome. Good deal. We're going to talk about, um, as, as I get started with the uh, pastoral prayer, we're going to mention a little bit about the flood victims and so forth, but anything else before we go? Um, the reason I did the insert this week and, and submit that for the pastoral prayer is, is I got a, an email from our district superintendent, and it, I, I don't know, it just seemed to, to fit. It seemed to fit well about all the prayer concerns we've had and all the people who have, um, who have suffered lately. So I'm just going to read to you a little bit of the body of the uh, email, and then we're going to pray. And when you look at that prayer, you look at the sheet, the part that's in bold is your all's part, and your response to what I'm going to read is, is Lord, hear our prayer. But first, let me read you a little bit about what he wrote, because I think it's, uh, I think it's important. He writes, Dear Church Family of the Heartland District, while still moving, you have to remember this was written on Friday, the September 30th, while still moving towards South Carolina, Ian has left a path of destruction, broken homes and broken lives in its wake. Lee County, Fort Myers Beach, Sanibel Island, Cape Coral, and many other communities are now broken communities of erased homes and dreams. While those things can be repaired eventually, the lives lost in this storm will be at the forefront of our attention in the days ahead. Of course, recovery for the Floridians will span many years into the future. Right now, as people are being rescued and the search for family members begins, they need the grace of our prayer support. We would be remiss to not also lift up those in the midst of recovery in western Kentucky and in eastern Kentucky and in the Red Bird Missionary Conference areas of our commonwealth. There is so much hurt right now, but there's also so much grace, love, and support that we, the family of God, have to offer. And then he writes this prayer. Jesus, our high priest, we lift up to you our prayers and our earnest concern for those who are suffering right now in this moment. We pray you lift up our prayers and those per to those persons, our Father in heaven, continuously as you continue your ministry of intercession for the world. For those of you, for those who have lost a family member due to this disaster, Lord, hear our prayers. For those who are cold, Hungry and without shelter. Lord, hear our prayers. For those in despair. Lord, hear our prayers. For those who feel broken beyond measure. Lord, hear our prayers. For the safety of the first responders who are giving aid. Lord, hear our prayers. For your church who is in the midst of these disasters and have a heart to help. Lord, hear our prayers. For our leaders on all government levels who are leading in the midst of disaster. 
for the children whose lives have been shaken off the foundations of all they know. Lord, hear our prayer. For the spiritual needs of those who are survivors, whose gaze now goes upward toward heaven and ask this tender question, why? Lord, hear our prayer. For these needs and the many needs unspoken, Lord, in the power of Christ's Spirit, move among us and through us those who hurt, those who hurt for the hurting, and those called to imitate our rabbi and teacher in all we do. Lord, hear our prayer. And as we say together this prayer, Jesus taught his disciples long ago, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able, please, as we sing our song of worship. Your words are on the screen. Ushers, if you'll come up. I invite you, if you would, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we say thank you for this day. Thank you for our opportunity to come together as this body of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we come together in worship. And Lord, we just ask that you receive our offerings, you teach us how to use it, teach us to be good stewards of all that you provide. It's in Jesus' great name we pray, amen. Hey, George.
Thank you all. Be seated, please. <clears throat> I want to share a quick story with you before, uh, before I get started. Uh, the other day I was reading through one of my textbooks, and for the life of me I can't remember which one I read it in, 
I can't remember who said it, so I can't give credit where it belongs. But I found this, this quote from this author pretty interesting. Um, we, we all like to get the best for our money, don't we? When we go to the grocery, if we have a, $100 to spend, we want to get as much out of that $100 as we possibly can. If we go to buy a house or a car or anything that there is, it, we want to get the most out of it that we possibly can. Is that right? We, I mean, we, we strive for that. This guy said, and I thought, I thought this was so true, education is the one thing that we pay for but we want the less out of. <laughs> that if we can manage to just like go to class and, and never do any work, if the, if, the, if the professor was okay with that, we'd do it. We wouldn't care. We'd pay for the class and pass. Yay, we'd celebrate. But education is the one thing that as people we're all willing to pay for, but we want to get as little of it as possible and get by. Don't you find that kind of strange? So it was my thought, what immediately came to my mind is our faith the same way. It's something that we all sort of want and we, it's something that we desire. Or you, just face it, you wouldn't be here. But sometimes I think we want as little of it as we think we can get by with. Kind of like there was a Country music song, I'm not going to remember the name of it. It was, a, it was a long, probably a long time ago. It said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. And then in, in there, they said, they, they just want to do enough to get in. If I can just manage to do just enough to get in. If I can do just enough good to get in. And I think sometimes we think about our faith that same way. If we can have just enough faith to get by. Just enough to get us in. Don't want to do too much. You know, don't want to overdo it. But anyway, and, and there's a purpose behind me telling you that story. We'll talk about that. Today's sermon title is called The Faith of a Mustard Seed. And I bet this is a familiar scripture to all of you. It comes out of Luke chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. If you wouldn't mind, please, as we read the gospel, if you stand, if you're able. <clears throat> The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now, sit down to eat. Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. And that's the word of God for the people of God. We say, thanks be to God. Be seated. Thank you all. Faith as small as a mustard seed. If you're like me, I always thought that meant that much could be done with a small amount of faith. That we could do a lot of things if we just had just that little, little bitty tiny bit of faith. And we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Because today's message is really more about our faith in general, I guess you could say. And some of you are probably thinking, well, my faith is just fine. I'm good. I've been coming to church my whole life. I think my faith is in pretty good shape. Scripture tells us that we're saved by our faith. And if our faith is increased by coming to church, then we're saved by coming to church. Right? Right? To me, that's like saying we could earn a diploma by just showing up at class. Right? Funny thing about schools, though, they expect you to read these things called textbooks. 
They expect you to do assignments. They expect you to take tests. They expect you to show up for class. There are expectations of you if you want your so-called diploma out of the school, right? We don't get a free ride. It's like when we go to work, right? We're paid to do a specific job. I don't know anybody that gets paid to just go show up, right? We're paid to do something specific. That we have our part we have to play. We have to put in effort if we want to get paid for the work that we do. Now, I think I should say that I'm not going to imply, or I'm trying not to imply that we are saved by our works. That's not it at all. And I think we all know different. We're saved by faith. But there have been, I don't know if it's fair to say denominations, but there have been pastors or preachers who maybe have had their own agenda that have led people, let's let's say, have led people astray. There are pastors who teach you that all you got to do is say these few magic words and bam, you're saved. That's all you need. Say these words and you're done. There are some preachers who will say that all you got to do is get baptized. That's getting your ticket punched to heaven. All you got to do is go to church long enough to talk them into baptizing you. And once you get baptized, you can go home and sit down because you're good. You're good to go. It makes me think, you know, People think a lot of times when they say those magic words that the preacher on TV tells them to say that, the, you know, the heavens are going to open, you know, the ray of light's going to shine down on you and the angels are going to sing, oh, and life's going to be just wonderful after that happens. But that's not reality either, is it? We get misled sometimes by, I don't know if we want to say well-intended people, But none of that is even close to how Jesus describes our walk of faith, is it? None of that is even close to when Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. If you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. He didn't say anything about magic words, did he? If we have a faith that's based on saying a few words or just based on the act of baptism alone and we think that's it, is that the kind of faith that's going to save us? We're saved by our faith. Is that the kind of faith that's capable of saving us? If we do that and then quit, we're done, we stop, we go on with life as we knew it before. So let's get into the scripture, and I want to talk about this just a little bit more. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. You ever ask God for that? You ever ask God to increase your faith in any way? We ask for a lot of increases from God, don't we? We ask God to increase a lot of things. Increase our bank account. Anybody ask for that? Anybody ever ask to win the lottery? Lord, help me win this lottery. I'm going to retire. We'll ask God to increase us in a lot of ways. There are people who um, have, have prayed for children. They had trouble conceiving maybe, and, they, and they've prayed for God. They want to increase their family, right? And then when those children get there and they, they, they start to go to middle school, and <laughs> we often pray to God, what happened? Is the warranty up on these kids? Can I send them back? Because these are broken. I want to return these. <laughs> one more thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of get back on it have you ever asked for the Lord to decrease something in your life take away something I did one time I stepped on the scale and I looked down and said Lord that can't be right <laughs> you need to take some of these numbers away that can't be it Jesus replied, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. I think it's in Matthew's gospel where they talk about 
uh, they will move a mountain. You can say to the mountain, throw yourself into the sea and that will be, and it will be done. That's where we get this idea of a faith that can move mountains, a faith that can move obstacles. And I'm not saying that that's not possible, that we can't speak to the mountain and it be moved. But what I think Jesus is doing here is he's using a little bit of hyperbole, a little bit of exaggerated, a little bit of exaggerated conversation to get their attention. But what it really is is to move those big objects in our life. We all come across the objects in our life. We all come across circumstances in our life that we have a hard time with, that we want the strength and the courage to get through. And I think that's what Jesus is talking about. You often hear about... Some people will talk about David and him slaying the giant, how that's a reference to we all have giants in our life. There's these big obstacles that come along in our life, these giants that we think we can't overcome, but through Christ, through faith, we can overcome. A faith as small as a mustard seed. The mustard seed, if it's not the smallest, it's at least one of the smallest seeds that are out there. I don't even know if you could see it when you hold it in your hand. I know they're tiny. And our faith in Jesus Christ usually starts out the same way, doesn't it? We find there's some reason something stirs inside of us and we find faith to believe in Jesus Christ. And over time, our faith starts to grow. Just like that mustard seed, when it is planted, it very quickly grows, and it grows into quite an, a substantial, mature plant. Our faith, when that is planted inside of us, when that desire to know Christ is planted inside of us, that faith has got to be watered, it's got to be nurtured, it's got to be cared for, if you want it to grow. You've got to read scripture. You've got to be in prayer. You've got to be a part of a church community, right? You've got to do the things that faith calls you to do. You've got to nurture that faith if you want it to grow into something. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is telling them. Your faith is going to start off so small, but because it's rooted soundly in Jesus Christ, it will grow. And that is the kind of faith that will grow, that will move mountains. It starts off small. But as you nurture it, as you take care of it, as it grows inside of you, that strength that you have will quickly and very easily move those obstacles and help you get through life. And then he tells this little parable. Suppose one of you has a servant. It doesn't, by the way, it doesn't say it's a parable. I'm assuming it's a parable because this is just his style. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down and eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Now, we really can't relate to that use of that parable right there because we don't, anybody in here got a servant? I don't. They're reluctant servants. That might be another sermon. Um, But you could certainly say if you had somebody that was working for you, somebody you paid to do something for you, we can kind of relate to that, right? Um, We could kind of switch that up a little bit. Would we say to that person, do you thank the person, we should thank the person that works for us for doing what they've been asked to do? Is that something that we would normally do? If somebody is paid to do something for you, a person comes out and cuts your grass and you pay them whatever the agreed amount is, do you thank them for cutting your grass or you just pay them and go on with your day? I'm going to invite Christy to come up because I'm going to try to close out with this last thought. Then Jesus says, and this is the line that I think is really important. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, right? When you've done everything Christ has asked you to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Jesus says, after we have done all that is expected of us as disciples, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as members of God's holy family, 
after we've picked up our cross and followed him everywhere he's asked us to go, everywhere he's led us, that we're still unworthy. Because we've only done what was expected of us. That's kind of harsh, isn't it? And you might be thinking, and, and I don't blame you, what, what does Jesus want? What else could he want from us? You mean we could do everything he asked us to do and that still wouldn't be good enough? That sounds crazy. What, what else could we possibly do besides do what he's asked us to do? Well, this is where we come full circle. It comes back to your faith. It should be because of our faith in Jesus and our love for Jesus that drives us to do what we do. Are gestures done outside of our faith empty gestures? It's because of our faith in Jesus Christ that we choose to love our neighbor, that we choose to love each other. We love our neighbor because Jesus loves our neighbor. We serve one another because Jesus came and served us first. We're saved by our faith in a risen Savior. And it's by God's grace that he was sent to pay the price that we could not he was the only payment that would do. It's our faith in that risen Savior that saves us. It's our faith and love in Jesus Christ that changes our heart. It's our faith that allows our hearts to be transformed. And if our lives are transformed by such a faith then that is a saving faith. A faith that mimics the life, the selfless actions of Jesus Christ. A life of service to God and others. It should be our faith that drives us to mirror the example that was set for us by Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing our closing song.